Chapters one and two of the Cross Brand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Cross Brand by Max Brand. One. Jack Bristol removed his feet from the table edge and sat up. It was a tribute of attention which any other man in Arizona would have paid willingly to Sheriff Harry Ganton. But what filled the eye of Jack Bristol was not the sheriff's person, but the sheriff's horse. The sight of the brown mare plucked a string in his heart of hearts and filled him with a melancholy of yearning. Such a horse as that could not be bought or bred. She was one of those rare sports which are produced by chance. A greyhound had more speed, a mountain sheep was more nimble climbing the rocks, but brown Susan could imitate both. She was put together with a mathematical nicety, like Jack Bristol's gun, of which she often made him think. But above and beyond physical prowess it was Susan's personality which delighted Jack, her starred forehead, her quick-stirring little ears, her great, bright, gentle eyes, and a wise way she had of cocking her head to one side in short she fitted nicely into the heart of jack bristol and he groaned to think that another man must always ride her she came to a stop just in front of the house the big sheriff dismounted as he stood beside her his six feet and odd inches of height his two hundred pounds of bone and muscle made her seem hardly more than a pony in fact she was a scant fifteen three jack knew yet she had carried ganton prodigious distances between sunrise and dark she was the foundation upon which his reputation had been raised two years before susan was a tender three-year-old and harry ganton was a newly elected and youthful sheriff in the past twenty-four months susan had demonstrated that robbers who committed crimes in the district which ganton protected were fools if they depended for safety upon the speed of their horses brown susan ran them down with consummate ease and once she brought harry ganton within range he was a known fighter the sheriff stepped out of sight and appeared again at the door of the house jack bristol greeted him with a wave of the hand and went to the window where susan had come to whinny to him with bright eyes of expectancy he began to slit apples into narrow sections she took them daintily from his fingers the sheriff in the meantime took a chair which he could tilt back against the wall too bad you don't own sue he said you and her get on uncommon well jack the head of jack bristol jerked around maybe she's for sale he asked but he sighed and shook his head without waiting for the answer suppose she were said the sheriff would you have the price to spare i'd find the price said jack he held a glistening bit of apple away while she reached greedily and vainly for it i'd find the price how insisted ganton jack bristol turned to the other with a peculiarly characteristic air of disdain as though he were one for whom probabilities had no interest he was a handsome fellow with lean clear-cut features and a blue eye which was almost black and he had a bold and confident glance which now dwelt upon the sheriff with unbearable steadiness he seemed to have many words on the tip of his tongue but he only said well, there are ways at this the sheriff shrugged his shoulders they were of one age just at thirty but jack bristol looked five years younger and the sheriff seemed in excess of his real age by the same margin burdens honorably assumed and patiently borne fierce labor honest methods had marked him with a gray about the forehead and lined his face to sternness or to weariness but the skin of jack bristol was as smooth as the skin of a child his eye was as clear the fingers which poised the fragment of apple above the velvet nose of susan were as tapered as the fingers of a woman labor had never misshaped that hand or calloused it the sheriff marked these things with a touch of bitterness they had gone to the same school at the same time he had fought his way through the studies jack bristol never opening a book the hours of his bright leisure never encroached upon had always led the class 
now so many years later it mattered not that ganton could savagely assure himself of his success and jack's failure the instant he came into the presence of the latter he felt his crushing inferiority there are ways hm echoed ganton but how jack the cards this time jack bristol turned his back squarely upon the mare though one hand behind him continued to pat her what the devil do you mean by that he asked i mean that everybody in town knows how you've kept your head up answered the sheriff we know that you're a fat one with the cards a crooked gambler hm i haven't said that i think you'd be honest at it thank you simply because you're too proud to admit that another man might have better luck than you what the devil ails you ganton what do you mean by coming here with this sort of talk what have i and my ways to do with you have you turned sky pilot maybe going to try for two jobs at once the sheriff flushed i'll tell you why i've come i've always kept out of your way well because you had nothing on me maybe i say i've never bothered you until you mixed up with my business then i had to let you know that i was around in your business last week you went to hemmingsworth to the dance in the schoolhouse didn't you jack bristol was again half turned away paying far more attention to the feeding of the mare than to the words of the sheriff but ganton persisted in his questions in spite of this insulting demeanour i suppose i did nodded jack i've forgotten forgotten that's the place where you met maud purcell and danced half the dances with her and made her town talk next day and ever since maud purcell i remember that name i guess you do she's a girl with pale eyes and freckles across her nose kind of cross-eyed too isn't she he spoke carelessly busy with the feeding of susan but from the corner of his eye he saw the sheriff writhe and it gave him a malicious pleasure i can't let you talk like that burst out the sheriff jack you didn't know or else not even you would have dared to talk like this but me and maud are engaged to get married you are said jack first he gave the last of the apple to the mare then he took out a handkerchief and began to wipe his fingers last of all he turned to the sheriff of course he said in that case i'm mighty sorry harry wouldn't have hurt your feelings for the world the sheriff very red of face watched him narrowly and sighed he had a perfect conviction that jack bristol knew all about his relations with pretty maud purcell he was reasonably sure that it was on this very account that jack had flirted so outrageously with maud on that evening but bristol was no man to force into a corner it would not do to anger him unless that were a last resort what i mean said the sheriff is this maud and me were engaged but the other day we busted it off jack started he flashed at the sheriff a glance of real concern but the latter was looking down in anguish to the floor and when he raised his head again jack had succeeded in smoothing his expression to indifference she gave me over said the sheriff again he mopped his forehead and the reason she done it was because because of the way you talked to her that night at the dance that's why i've come here to talk to you jack jack bristol looked back into his mind in dismay maud purcell on that night with her yellow hair and blue dress and gay smile had been the prettiest girl on the dance floor also she gained piquancy through jack's knowledge that she was the bride-to-be of the sheriff he and harry ganton were old enemies they were the bywords of the town he was the example of riotous living and idleness held up to the youth of the community harry ganton was the example of what a young man may accomplish by industry and frugal living it had been a shrewd temptation to win the girl away from thoughts of her lover for a single evening but to lead to this result certainly had never been in his mind and the first thing i gotta ask said the sheriff is this what sort of intentions have you got toward maud jack bristol had been on the verge of stepping across the room shaking the hand of harry with an apology for his conduct and promising his best assistance in smoothing out the tangle but the stern voice of the sheriff threw him back into another mood at once he could never be driven with whips where he might be led by the slightest crooking of a finger 
in fact the humour of jack was generally that of a spoiled boy are you her father asked jack where's your right to ask me what my intentions are i got the right of a man whose happiness is tied up in what you may do exclaimed poor ganton turning pale with emotion well harry i haven't made up my mind then give me a chance to help you make it up go as far as you like in the first place are you the sort that makes a marryin man how do you mean by that ain't a man if he's going to marry got to be the sort that will provide a home for his wife and enough for her and their kids to live on you think i couldn't do that you could do it plumb easy that ain't the thing would you do it wouldn't you get tired of the house and everything in it wouldn't you want a change ain't that the way you've been all the rest of your life well maybe it is it's a sure enough fact look around here at this house why i can remember the day your father died this was the best house in red bend we all used to look up to it it was the sort of a house that we all wanted to build and live in some day if we ever got to be that rich and look at the house now look where the rain has leaked in through the roof that you ain't ever repaired see where it's streaked and stained the walls look where the wallpaper is beginning to peel off and where it's faded the floor is all in waves in your big dining room you sold all the good furniture you've got only a bunch of junk left the roof of your big barn is busted and sagging in your cows have been sold down to just a few dozen you only got a couple of hosses you've loaded your ranch up to the ears with mortgages and now i ask you jack to stand back and look at things fair and square including yourself after you've had a good look tell me if you're the kind that makes a family happy are you against his will jack bristol had been forced to follow the eager words of the sheriff the unhappy picture was painted in vivid strokes and out of his memory was drawn the coloring for it all the prosperity of his youth floated past him like a tantalizing vision behind it was the face of his father that too indulgent man it is when we feel our guilt too keenly that we are most apt to anger also no doubt the sheriff had paid more attention to truth than to tact ganton said jack i'm glad to know what you think of me but it don't follow that that's what i think of myself as for the girl if she got tired of you i'm sorry for you but maybe she figures it shows she has sense we all have a right to our opinions eh? Huh? the sheriff changed color again but he kept himself strongly under control you're hot-headed now jack but i know that you ain't as hard as all that you ain't going to keep up your game with maud just for the sake of putting me in the fire eh? Huh? what game said jack suppose that maud and i should decide to step off together what then why shouldn't we marry why echoed the sheriff looking wildly about him jack you don't mean it is there any law on your side to stop us asked the other cruelly there is said the sheriff and he rose from his chair name it partner it's this the sheriff tapped the gun hanging at his side i'll put an end to you first bristol i've seen you spoil everything you've touched i ain't going to see you spoil her face not while i'm wearing a gun jack bristol gasped as one immensely surprised anger followed more slowly you damned blockhead he fumbled for words stop me with a gun me his right hand trembled down to his own weapon and came away again he whipped out bull durham and brown papers and rolled himself a smoke which he lighted and walked hurriedly up and down the room a wisp of smoke following him and banking up into a little cloud when he turned get out harry he implored the sheriff get out before something happens I know you're a good fighter everybody around these parts thinks that you can't be beat but you know and i know that i'm faster and straighter with a gun i don't know what's got into your crazy head are you hunting for a way to die it don't make no difference said the sheriff i've come here to make you promise that you'd give up maud if i couldn't persuade you to do it i was going to make you and that goes i'd rather see you dead and me hanging for the murder than to have maud's life ruined what are both of our lives compared with hers harry go home and think it over said jack bristol you ain't talkin sense you know you can't budge me you ain't man enough you never were 
answer me one way or the other jack will you give her up you know that even if you had her you couldn't be true to her you ain't made that way all your life the girls have talked soft to you you've had your way paved with smiles they don't mean nothing to you maud would be getting the first wrinkles before long and then you'd be through with her i know how it'd be you'd leave her you've never stuck to the same girl for a whole summer ain't that a fact so i ask you will you give her up i'll see you damned first then god help one of us he pitched himself to one side while a swift flexion of hand and wrist brought out the colt it began spitting fire and ploughing the floor with lead the first bullet split a board at the feet of jack bristol the second as the gun was raised was sure to drive into the body of jack himself but before that second shot a forty five caliber slug struck the sheriff in the breast and knocked him against the wall he recoiled gasping fired from a wobbling hand a bullet that tore upward through the roof and then dropped upon his face two that impact forced up on either side of the body a puff of dust which was deep on the floor before the little cloud settled jack bristol was beside the prostrate man and had jerked him over to his back there was a deep gash across his forehead where he had struck the floor blood was hot and thick on the breast of his coat jack kneeled fumbled for the pulse felt none and sprang up again to flee for his life down the street men were calling he heard them with wonderful clearness hey billy come in there's hell's a poppin up at i'm comin where's jordan hey pop we've got to get rum boys that's enough of us but still they clamored as they swept slowly up the street no they were not moving slowly they were only slow by comparison with the leaping speed with which the brain of jack bristol was considering possibilities should he stay to demand his trial as a man fighting in self-defense no that would never do he could hear beforehand the roar of angry mirth with which redbend would hear of this plea from jack bristol gambler from time to time spendthrift on all occasions while the money lasted and a gunfighter extraordinary no he must never dream of standing his ground his first difficulty would be to find a fast horse his gray gelding was fast enough to escape most pursuit but the gray was in a distant pasture but why should he worry about getting a fast horse when brown susan herself stood just outside his window and why not be hunted for horse stealing as well as murder he was out of the window as that thought half formed susan drew back but only a step he whipped into the saddle with half a dozen men plunging toward him the leaders not fifty yards away with the liquid dust spurting up around their feet he had known those men all of his life but now they went at him like town dogs at a wolf yelling he's got harry he's dropped the sheriff shoot the hound jack bristol sent sue into a racing gallop with a single word in an instant he had twitched her around the corner of the house with a flight of bullets singing behind her she took a high fence flying she sprinted across a cleared space beyond she winged her way across a second fence and was hopelessly out of range for effective revolver shooting before the pursuers reached the corner of the house so they tumbled into the house instead of continuing and there they found the sheriff dripping with blood in the act of rising from the floor leave jack alone were his first words i'm not killed i brung this on myself he glanced a chunk of lead along my ribs and i deserved it get doc chisholm boys but jack has grabbed susan here the sheriff groaned but almost at once he controlled himself and answered then let him take her till he finds out that he ain't wanted here all i hope to god is that he don't turn desperado because he thinks that he's done one killin already of course jack bristol could not know it but that was the reason there was no pursuit he himself attributed it to the known speed of brown susan the good citizens of red bend knew enough about her not to expect to run her down in a straight chase only by maneuver and adroit laying of traps could they expect to capture the man who bestrode her such was the reason to which jack bristol attributed the failure of any pursuit 
though as a matter of fact sheriff ganton was sending out hasty messages in all directions striving to head off the fugitive and let him know that the law had no claim against him it was all the easier for the sheriff to send those messages because that night maud purcell sat by his bed to nurse him the more brilliant and dashing figure of jack bristol might have turned her head for the instant but when she heard of the wounding of harry ganton all doubt was dissolved a voice spoke out of her heart and drove her to the sheriff's side but that night jack bristol squatted beside the thin and wavering smoke of his campfire and peered from his hilltop into the desert horizon with the feeling that the hostility of the world encompassed him with as full as perfect and unbroken a circle and in truth it was not altogether an unpleasant sensation it was a test of strength and he had plenty of that he stretched his arms and felt the long muscles give with a quiver yes he had plenty of strength he felt also that for the first time he was playing the role for which he was intended he was no producer he was simply a consumer he was framed by nature to take not to make he was equipped with an eye which saw more surely a hand which struck more quickly a soul without dread of others and all his life he had felt that law was a burden not made for him to carry now the band was snapped and as the first fruit of his labor behold brown susan he turned with a word the mare came to him like a dog she regarded him with glistening affectionate eyes until a cloud of smoke filled her nostrils she snorted the smoke out and retreated but still from the little distance she regarded him with pricking ears he had known her since she was a foal he had loved her from the first as a miracle of horseflesh. Harry Ganton, consenting to his plea, had allowed him to break the filly in her third year, and now in her fifth, what wonder was it that she obeyed him almost by instinct? The sheriff had been like an interloper upon her back. Here was her true master, and was it not worth while to be guilty of a theft when stealing brought such a reward as this? in a sort of ecstasy jack bristol sprang up and began pacing up and down they would never catch him now that he had brown susan no doubt they were laying their traps even now but their traps would never catch him other men weaker men after they committed their crimes were sure to circle back to their home town sooner or later but he would prove the exception there were no ties of a sufficient strength to make him return no he would lay a course straight to the north and strike a thousand miles into the mountains he lived up to the letter of that resolution for the three following days he pressed on at great speed to outstrip the first rush of the pursuit at the end of that time he struck a more steady and easy gait and every stage of the journey brought him further and further on the journey north during the first week if he had gone into any town he would probably have found news which would have made him return on his tracks but he avoided all towns and soon he was in a strange land to which the following messages of honest harry ganton never extended so the day at last came far far north in the rockies when he decided that he must have come into a new land where no one could have heard of him brown susan had just topped a great height from the shoulder of the mountain he saw a host of smaller peaks marching away in ridge on ridge to the farther north all as sharp as waves which a storm has whipped up to points heavy forests filled the hollows and the lower stretches it thinned as it climbed until it came to the desert at timberline from that point of vantage it seemed an eternity of mountains they seemed to roll out in all directions to the end of the world it was sunset time the summits were bright the lowlands were already black and jack bristol born and bred to the open of the flat desert shuddered a little before he allowed susan to lurch on to the down slope all strange country is apt to be terrible this prospect chilled the man from the desert to the very heart but he reassured himself he had lived on the country through a thousand-mile trip he had not spent a cent 
On one occasion he had slipped into an outlying ranch house and stolen an ample supply of ammunition. Otherwise he had not needed the assistance of men. Neither had Brown Susan. She had the lines of an Arab, but she had the incredible durability of a Mustang. Now she was a trifle gaunt of belly, her forward ribs were showing, but her head was as high, her eye as bright, her tail as arched as when she began the long journey. If horse and rider could survive what they had survived, there was surely nothing to concern them even in a forest wilderness. Where there were living trees, other things must live also but when they reached the bottom of the slope susan going with goat-footed agility among the rocks and the damp thick shadow of premature night closed above their heads jack bristol cursed softly and it seemed to him that half of the high spirit went out of the mare at the same instant she went timorously on a great roaring grew out at them from the right it turned into the distinguishable dashing of a waterfall and this, in turn, struck out a thousand varying echoes from cliffs and steep hillsides, so that noises continually played around them. Next they entered a blackness of a great forest. They made their way, not by light, but by distinguishing shadows among shadows, and the penetrating dampness was like an accumulating weight upon the spirit of Jack Bristol the way at length began to pitch up again the trees grew more sparse and presently opening into a pleasant clearing he found himself face to face with a little cabin it was made of logs but it was quite pretentious in size rather than use up any of the arable land in the level space below it and on account of which no doubt it had been built the cabin stood among the rocks of the farther slope leaning back to keep from a fall altogether it seemed to jack bristol the most beautiful dwelling he had ever looked upon a horse neighed from a small pasture near the house susan quivered on the verge of replying but a sharp slap on the flank made her shake her head and change her mind with a soft little grunt in the meantime from his place of secure shadow jack watched the smoke rise straight above the stovepipe until it reached a region of greater light the smoke column for mysterious reasons was an assurance that kindly people inhabited the house to be sure it would be better to go on but when the wind carried a faint scent of frying bacon to the nostrils of bristol he gave way he crossed the clearing without dismounting he leaned from the saddle and tapped at the door it was opened by a bald-headed man with a roman nose and a great mass of dirty gray beard his sleeves were rolled up over hairy forearms in one hand he carried a great butcher knife greasy and steaming howdy said jack bristol have you got room for an extra man to-night howdy stranger said the man of the log cabin he paused while he surveyed jack keenly i reckon i might End of chapter two Chapters three and four of the Cross Brand by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Three. When he came in, carrying his bridle and the saddle heavy with his pack, he found that the interior of the cabin was less in keeping with its exterior and more in keeping with the appearance of the big man of the bald head. For there was a great deal of dirt and confusion and darkness the cabin had been laid out and built upon a most pretentious scale as though there had been any quantity of muscle and axe power available at the time of its construction besides this big central room there was another room at each end of the house though apparently these apartments were now of use merely as junk rooms it was plain at a glance that a number of men and only men lived here no woman could have endured such confusion for an instant guns harness old clothes in varying stages of dirt and decay rusted spurs broken knives homemade furniture shattered by ill usage littered the floor or hung from pegs along the wall every corner was a junk heap the usable space on the floor was an ellipse framed with refuse no one who lived in this adobe had ever thought of throwing things away 
what was broken lay where it fell until it was kicked from underfoot and landed crashing against the wall jack went into the room at the western end of the house and cleared a space to lay down his blankets then he returned to the host who was in the act of dropping more wood into the stove as he did so the red flame leaped and by that light he saw the mountaineer more clearly the skin of his face glistened as though coated with a continual perspiration in all the places where the beard did not grow but the beard came up high on the cheeks and was only trimmed one could see where it threatened to get in the way by becoming too long to ward against that it was chopped off square a few inches below the chin and it thrust straight out in a wiry tangle the outthrust of the beard completed the regularity of the facial angle the slope carried up from the beard along the crooked nose and from the nose along a narrow sharply slanted forehead in the middle of that forehead was a peculiar scar in the form of a roughly made cross jack had not seen it at first but when the fire leaped the scar glistened white and was plainly visible altogether he was an ugly fellow and his ugliness was summed up in a pair of eyes which considering the great length of the face and the great bulk of the body were amazingly small when jack came closer he noted a peculiar freak about those eyes the beard was chiefly gray and dirt in color but once it must have been a rich red and the eyelashes which were of remarkable length were still of the original deep red unfaded to their very tips so that when he squinted it was almost as though he were looking out of reddish eyes he was squinting now as he looked across at jack bristol a hoss like that one you ride a man must be pretty interested in traveling fast to want a hoss like that observed the mountaineer maybe said jack and as he spoke he went to the back door of the house opened it and whistled at once brown susan whinnied in answer during their three weeks on the road they had grown wonderfully intimate wonderfully in accord the man of the cabin marked this interchange of calls with a gaping interest might be a circus hoss to be as smart as that he suggested might be answered jack bristol his reluctance to talk brought a scowl from the other the big man shifted his weight from one foot to the other widening the distance between his feet and hitched his trousers higher they were secured with a heavy canvas belt drawn extremely tight for in spite of his fifty-odd years of age the man of the cabin was as gaunt-waisted as a youth he was almost as agile also in his movements around the cabin stepping with the gliding ease of a young athlete jack bristol watched him with a growing aversion he could not talk to such a great beast of a man but since he was about to accept the hospitality of the fellow he was ill at ease supper however was now ready they ate boiled potatoes half seared bacon stale corn pone and coffee which was an impenetrable and inky black and while they ate on either side of the rough-hewn plank laid on sawbucks which served as a table they spoke not a word jack bristol rallied himself once or twice to speak but on each occasion his voice failed him for when he lifted his glance he never failed to be startled and awed by the red-tinted eyes of the man of the mountains afterward jack retired to the pasture saw that all was well with the mare and then came in to his blankets he had barely turned himself in them when he was soundly asleep that sleep was broken up by a crashing fall he sat up and found that the door to his sleeping-room was dimly outlined with light but after the noise there was no sound a sudden fear gripped jack bristol he realized in fact that all his nerves were on edge for in his sleep he had dreamed of the man of the bald head and the red fringed eyes and the dream had been a horror he stole to the door and lying down flat on his side he found that he was able to look into the larger room and there he saw not one but two men the one was his host of earlier in the evening the other was a younger man who was also less bulky the lower half of his face was shrouded like that of the elder man with dense beard save that in his case the beard was of jetty black they sat now with their heads raised in the attitude of people listening 
the stranger was in the act of finishing a meal his right hand still surrounded his tin coffee cup his left hand shoved back his plate presently he shrugged his shoulders leaned picked up from the floor another tin plate whose fall had apparently caused the racket they conversed for a moment now in murmuring voices not a syllable of which reached the understanding of jack bristol but he had seen and heard enough to alarm him seriously the fall of a plate would not have been enough to freeze them into such attitudes as he had discovered them in if their minds had been innocently employed and neither would it be necessary for them to lower their voices so much now certainly it was not mere consideration for the sleeping guest which controlled them the younger man was now talking eagerly with many gestures while the other listened with a scowl so black that the shining scar on his forehead quite disappeared he shook his head violently from time to time but the younger still insisted and finally seemed to beat down the resistance of him of the bald head he half rose he swept his right hand through a curving horizontal line in the air then with both hands he gestured down it came sharply home to jack bristol that they were talking about a horse they were talking about a horse and therefore they must be talking about susan for who could speak of any other when brown susan was near the conclusion they reached was now patent they started up from the table of one accord once the elder man was persuaded he was completely of the youngster's mind he caught up from the table a long revolver which had been lying there while they talked the youth produced two weapons of the same sort and side by side they strode softly down the room and straight toward the door behind which jack bristol lay but the revolvers were not the chief centre of his interest that upon which his gaze fastened was the forehead of the youth which when the latter turned toward the door displayed upon it a great glistening scar in the shape of a cross for a moment jack could not stir even noticed at random upon the face of one man that scar had been a grisly and forbidding thing but seen on another it was increased a thousandfold in interest it became a horror it was a human brand and certainly there was a grim story behind it what was of first importance to jack was that men who were forced to bear this grisly mark of identification on their foreheads would be capable of any sort of action he himself rose to his feet stepped back to his blankets found his cartridge belt and drew forth the long revolver which hung in a holster attached to it so armed he stole on to the window but when he came closer to it he saw that he could not attempt to leave in that manner it was so narrow that he was almost sure to be wedged in it and if he were he would be at the mercy of the others before he could make a more careful examination the door to the main room opened and the two entered the younger man walking first with both of his weapons raised and his shadow lunging before him he leaned over the blankets then straightened with a gasp dad he's gone the instant he lowered his guns as he spoke jack bristol sprang forward he had no will to fight them both on those cramped quarters either by himself would have been more than enough to engage a hardy man together they made tremendous odds as he leaped in jack aimed and drew the trigger but instead of an explosion and a bullet driven into the body of blackbeard there was only a loud click and a hollow jar of the hammer descending upon an empty chamber his gun had been emptied before the attack was undertaken blackbeard whirled with a short cry both guns blazing and jack sprang to the side a bullet stung his side a mere clipping of the skin before him loomed the two-gun man with weapons leveled and not two yards between them jack dropped to his knees as the guns roared in unison the flash had been in his very eyes the scent of powder was choking and stinging in his throat half blinded he dived in toward the legs of the other his shoulders struck beneath the knees down upon him toppled the mountaineer with a yell of alarm 
they whirled into a tangle of clutching striking hands and twining legs in the background jack saw the bald-headed man stepping swiftly about striving to get in a blow or a shot but never able to secure a chance without endangering his son strong fingers caught at jack's throat he beat the hand away the fingertips tearing into the flesh like hot irons and as they whirled again he caught at the flash of the revolver which blackbeard still held jerked it down and strove to tear it away the gun exploded blackbeard sank in a limp heap and jack bristol stood up with an effective weapon in his hand he stood up with the roar of the father ringing in his ears and a storm of bullets pouring toward him he raised the gun to answer that outburst of fire and lead but he was struck on the head a blow that knocked the flash of the mountaineer's exploding colt into a thousand sparks he toppled back into a sea of fire that did not burn four he wakened with a grip of rope stinging his wrists there was a bandage around his head his face and neck and shirt were still wet from the water with which his wound had been washed above him were the stars he was seated upon the damp ground his shoulders resting against the log wall of the cabin his brain noted these changes in swift succession then a shadow crept over him it was the shadow of a man swinging up and down across the shadow of a lantern as he dug with a spade in the dirt the silhouette grew more living as his senses returned all at once he recognized the face and the bulky body of the father he stood in a hole which was already almost hip deep and it was sinking rapidly at the edge of the growing heap of dirt which the laboring spadesman threw out lay a limp form with the pale glimmer of the forehead turned up to the sky and the lower part of the face lost in the black shadow of a beard and jack knew that he was watching the burial of the son by the father he himself had been dragged out there for what end to be buried alive with the dead body of the boy there was no brutality he felt which was past the capacity of the man of the bald head the care with which his head had been bandaged might augur a more terrible torment for which he was being saved he moved his legs the feet he found were tied together as fast as the hands and he was utterly helpless in the meantime the hole sank with astonishing rapidity to the midsection the shoulders and the head of the digger finally there was only the grinding of the spade against stones now and then and the briefly seen shadow of the spade as it swung up above the mound of dirt for an instant then the big man climbed out and stood mopping his forehead and neck with a handkerchief he was breathing heavily and when he put away the handkerchief he turned leaning upon the spade and peered into the depth of the hole he had just finished digging that ain't bad he said at length that ain't bad work not for me getting old hello jack had neither stirred nor spoken but with this exclamation the mountaineer wheeled about and strode up to his captive propping his hands against his knees he leaned over and stared into the face of jack wide awake and feeling fine eh he suggested his cheerfulness made jack shudder he returned no answer wide awake and feeling fine repeated the other as though a proper reply had been made that's as it should be he turned again lifted the body beside the dirt mound climbed the heap and disappeared into the shadow beyond after a little time he reappeared and stood for some time at the verge of the grave buried in thought the place was so profoundly quiet that jack could hear the rustling of the leaves blown to him from the far side of the clearing swishing and crisping together like silk skirts on dancers and with every moment the horror increased the big man came back to him touched the rope which bound his feet with a knife and then helped him strongly to his feet he was led in silence to the edge of the grave the mountaineer held up the lantern until the light fell upon the pale young bearded face within the shadow glistening on the cross which marked his forehead what i ask you man to man stranger said the older man is do you think when god sees him like that he'll bear any malice for what he's done what do you think the certainty that he had to do with a madman swept over jack 
but while his blood was freezing in the first shock of that conviction the other went on to quietly answer his own question no there ain't going to be no malice born look at the chance that he had it wasn't no chance at all he dropped a heavy hand upon the shoulder of jack him down there said the mountaineer was the youngster of the lot his beard came out blacker'n hell but he ain't no more'n twenty-two look how white his face is the sun didn't have no time to burn him brown he was the youngster of the four and he was worth the other three if it come to walkin runnin ridin shootin there wasn't one of em that could touch him i seen a time when he wasn't more'n fifteen and the rest of us got nothing but snow off the mountains out would go charlie no matter what kind of weather that wouldn't stop him and he'd come back with a mess of partridge a meal of something i seen a time when he was sick the rest of us had done the hunting for a week we got nothing nothing to speak of that is charlie gets up from his bunk he goes out it was along in the first black of the evening two minutes after he started we heard his rifle working we run out and right yonder on the far side of the clearing we seen him standing over a bear that he just drilled clean and when we come up we seen that the foam from the bear's mouth was slabbered all over charlie's boots that's the sort of nerve he had even when he was a kid he just stood up and kept pumping lead into the bear till the varmint dropped in the nick of time that's the sort that charlie was he dragged off his battered hat and looked up if i'd a had ten wives instead of one and all of the ten had four sons there wouldn't a been another charlie and he was enough to have got back at the rest of em for me he'd a made em get down and crawl in the end damn them damn them to hell he uttered the last words with a quiet savagery his voice did not rise but his whole body shook with his rage well he said finally that's finished i take my luck the way i find it charlie's gone i'll find some other way of getting back at him he turned upon jack a baleful glance get back over yonder he said don't try no running away you got your hands tied behind you and that way you couldn't run fast enough to keep away from me and if i caught you i'd make you think that hell was a church party compared to what i'd do to you he spoke these violent words in a voice of no more than conversational loudness but they were more convincing to jack than if they had been shouted at his ear he obeyed the order and stood quietly while the other shoved and scooped the great mound of soft dirt into the grave when it was ended he stepped to the side of the clearing stooped and then returned staggering under the weight of an immense rock which when dropped upon the mound sank half its diameter into the soft earth the father kept up the labor until he had covered the grave of his son with a great heap of boulders at length he stepped back filled a pipe and while he lighted it looked with great complacence upon his work take it by and large he said it would be considerable wolf that would dig down under them rocks eh? he chuckled softly then turned his back upon that scene and escorted jack to the house here he hung the smoky lantern on a high peg motioned jack to a seat on one of the stools which served the place instead of chairs and since the night was growing rapidly cold kindled a brisk fire in the stove the draught roared up the chimney and set the flimsy stovepipe shaking and softly rattling the glow of warmth spread above it floated the wide drift of the mountaineer's pipe smoke speaking by and large he said a man might say that no good comes out of fine-looking hosses there's only one thing that racing is good for and that's for the hosses that does the runnin them that own the hosses go to hell i've seen em start i've seen em finish he delivered this little series of moralities without looking at jack in a fashion which was peculiarly his own canting his head and gesturing toward jack while he faced quite another point in the compass jack found no reply which he could make so he waited and all the while his eager restless eyes went up and down the strong body and the unhuman face of the other he was striving to solve a riddle and meeting with no success the man now picked up a poker and inserted it into the fire under one of the top covers of the stove you think said jack at last that i'm going to make a fuss about what's happened but that ain't what's in my mind 
fact is i'm glad enough to be up and kicking i'll give you my word that you'll hear no more of me the minute i get my hands free or better still keep my hands tied let me get on the back of my hoss and then turn me loose how does that strike you the other smoked steadily and gravely throughout jack bristol's speech he regarded his captive with the most profound attention wrinkling his brows until the scar as usual went out of sight i suppose maybe that sounds like the right thing for you to do he said at length but i got something else figured out you wouldn't see the why of it if i was to tell you but a gent needs patience to get on any place a gent needs a pile of patience and i'm a patient man after they done their trick with me i come up here with my family anybody else would have tried to get back at em one by one right away but i didn't do that i waited i come up here where there was nobody else and i waited and waited for my boys to grow up they growed up strong and straight and every one of em was a hard fighter and a good shot but i lost the three of em by hard luck and still i had charlie that's worth all the other three do you think that i turned charlie loose on em then no partner i didn't i kept him here all quiet he was wise enough and quick enough to have gone down at him like a wolf but i waited and waited i'd get him bigger and bigger i'd get him quicker still with a gun and then i'd give him a list of em and turn him loose that was what i was waiting so patient for i've waited more than twenty years for it and at the end of the twenty years just when charlie is about to be sprung on him along you come all made up a hell-fire and claws and yonder is my twenty years a hoping and waiting a lying in the ground at the conclusion of this long speech during all of which he had failed to meet the eye of jack for a single instant he rose from his chair what i've been saying he said you mostly don't understand right now but you'll know more about it in a year from now jack bristol drew a longer breath whatever devilry might be stirring through the strange brain of this man at least he did not intend murder a year from now continued the mountaineer you'll be riding your hoss around these hills and then you'll understand everything that i've been saying now and i got patience enough to wait till then so saying he stepped to the side of the room took down a length of rope and with it approached his victim there was no possible purpose to be gained by resistance jack submitted while he was trussed hand and foot so that he could not move even his head was lashed into a rigid position against a stake which was passed down his back with this done the other stepped back regarded jack for a critical moment then went to the stove and took from it the poker the fire had turned the end of the iron rod into a living thing it pulsed with heat light waves ran up and down it it snapped sparks to a distance and it cast a white radiance over the slanting face of the mountaineer the first premonition as to his purpose struck through jack bristol yet he could not believe it was only when the big man advanced squarely upon him that he cried you infernal devil if realization of his helplessness stopped his mouth he waited a great hand thrust out and the strong fingers twisted into his hair which he wore quite long looking up quite fascinated by the horror it seemed to him that the red-gray beard barely sufficed to cover a grin of pleasant anticipation then the white-hot iron was thrust against his forehead he closed his eyes a hot fume and smoke of burning flesh choked him he felt the burning point pass down his forehead then it crossed the first mark with a line to the side end of chapter four chapters five and six of the cross brand by max brand this librivox recording is in the public domain five the longest days are our silent days of inaction and the weeks which followed were to jack bristol a more interminable period than all the life which went before he was guarded night and day with the most scrupulous care and when his captor whose name he had discovered in the interim to be hank sherry left the cabin to go hunting 
jack was chained like a dog in the corner and hands and feet secured so that he could not stir for the rest when hank was at home he allowed his captive a reasonable liberty twice a day immediately after the branding of jack's forehead the mountaineer had changed the dressing upon the wound treating it with the utmost care but as for the reason behind the mutilation or as for the purpose for which jack was held in the shack no information was vouchsafed on any other subject hank sherry was voluble though he chiefly dwelt upon the exploits and prowess of charlie the last of his sons yet he was quite willing to talk of other things such as hunting or storm and stress of weather there in the mountains or any of a thousand topics saving any which tended to expose his past life and so the long days passed slowly one into another until a time came when big hank sherry sat opposite him at the supper-table combing his red-gray beard and staring out of his red-fringed eyes suppose a man wants to get a dog fightin mad what does he do with him asked the mountaineer he went on to answer his own question turning his face away from jack in that way he had and addressing his speech to a distant corner he takes the dog and ties him up and waits till he gets will to be free then he sets him loose and the hardest job he has is to get himself out of the way of that dog's teeth the glance of hank reverted for an instant to jack suppose i was to turn you loose jack looked hastily down but even so the other had seen the sudden and fierce light of exultation what you're thinkin said hank is that you'd jump for my throat and work your hands through my beard till you got a grip on the windpipe still looking to the corner he slipped his own hand under his beard and seemed to touch his throat tenderly but if i was to say to you first give me your word of honor that if i turn you free you'll not lay a hand on me what would you say jack bristol made no answer but he watched the big man as a fox watches the chicken beyond the shielding net of wire hank laughed softly there was something about the attitude of the other which seemed to please him immensely blood said he that's what you want oh i can see that i see a bull terrier go at a great dane once he slipped in under him and set his teeth in the dane's throat there was a lot of threshing around but in the finish the dane lay down on his side nice and peaceable and the terrier choked him to death and if you got at me it'd be the same story he shook his head his eyes looking afar beyond the remembered battle he seemed more pleased than ever the fine part of it continued hank is that you're going to be on my side again the rest of em in the end on your side said jack bristol i'm a patient man said hank i'm willing to wait and wait and now about that promise most like you've been telling yourself over and over what you're going to do when the time comes that you get loose you've been seeing my eyes get glassy in your dreams that's why i got to have your promise you hear jack paused if mere words could buy his freedom would he not be pardoned if he broke his vow when his hands were loosed what promise he asked why a promise that you'll do me no harm i'll give you that then hank nodded and behind the vast shrubbery of his beard he seemed to be smiling keep right on thinking he said you keep it in your head that if i wanted to play safe i could dig another hole out yonder i could make it big enough to hold a hoss and a man and after i put you and your susan hoss in it who'd ever guess that you'd been here who'd ever ask questions the skin prickled upon jack's head you can't keep murder under your hat he declared it comes out sooner or later how many has been up to ask about charlie remarked the mountaineer been some weeks now and there ain't been a soul by to speak for him has there into the silence drifted the cry of a wolf howling on the verge of mute distance in some way it showed jack more plainly than words could have done how utterly he was in the hands of the other i've given you my word he said and you've had a chance to think it over said the mountaineer so there you are as he spoke he took from the table the razor edge butcher knife he took no time to untie ropes which he would not need again one slash set the feet of jack at liberty another cut free the hands which had been tied behind his back he was loosed from his bonds 
his life was set suddenly to music of a higher scale his strength of body was multiplied and in the grip of his hands stood the man who had brutally disfigured him for life and then chained him up like a dog he crouched that infinitesimal bit which tells of tensed muscles ready to leap and strike but big hank sherry had calmly turned his back tossed the butcher knife onto the table and now approached the stove lifted a lid and shoved in a stick of wood to replenish the dying fire as he did this he was engaged in humming faintly an old tune whose words jack had never known but whose music he could never forget thereafter his own fury to attack was checked and dammed up in him he could not spring at the man while his back was turned the fire was roaring again around the new fuel hank replaced the lid and turned not directly toward jack but merely enough so that the latter could see the face of his late captor covered with sudden perspiration so he walked straight toward the door of the cabin sherry called jack the latter halted seemed about to turn and jack set himself to rush while in a semi-hysterical fury he felt possessed of strength enough to tear the big man limb from limb but after that momentary halt the mountaineer continued straight on his way and went out into the night still for an instant jack stared at the door then he rushed out into the night but found that the other had melted away among the trees near his house sherry he called at the top of his voice sherry where are you he heard no answer and at length he turned and stamped back into the cabin as his disappointment subsided he was beginning to realize the consummate nerve and steadiness which the older man had shown he had known that the plighted word of his captive meant little or nothing in such an extremity but he had trusted to the instinctive honor which would keep the man of the desert from attacking while his back was turned at least the mountaineer would return after he had allowed his late captive sufficient time to cool down to fill that interval there was one thing of importance for jack to do in the corner was the old closet in which sherry had placed the mirror on the first day jack took the axe which leaned against the wall and with one stroke smashed the lock then from the interior of the closet he saw the faint glimmer of glass as the lantern played feebly upon it he snatched the mirror out held it up and looked upon the image of his face for the first time since his captivity began what he saw was a black and curling beard that covered the lower part of his face all the skin that the beard did not cover was extraordinarily pale but whiter by far than the skin of his forehead was a scar which formed a perfect cross glistening in his flesh truly he was branded forever with a cry he snatched up the revolver from the holster of the mountaineer hanging against the wall and with that weapon in his hand he ran out into the night in a blind madness he ranged among the trees twice he fired into empty shadows which seemed to move and so he came back at last to the cabin and saw by the lantern light the peaceful figure of the mountaineer with his stool tilted back against the wall while he whittled calmly at a piece of wood and puffed on his pipe stand up roared jack but hank sherry merely removed the pipe from his teeth and shook his head as though in gentle reproof it looks to me he said like the end of a day's work why should i stand up because it's the end of a life and a day all at the same minute said jack damn you get up i've got your word replied the other you yeller livered skunk cried jack do you dare to talk about promises to me you tried to murder me sleeping now you talk about honor my honor echoed the big man and as always his voice remained singularly small and even i ain't said a word about my honor what i'm talking about is yours lord god man i've done pretty near every bad thing in the calendar and i've busted more'n one promise amongst the rest but ain't you different why sure you are if i hadn't knowed you was different do you think i'd a trusted to your promise i knowed that you'd get heated up at first and that's why i kept my back to you but after a while i come back cause i figured that when i seen you there'd be no more'n a lot of words and smoke and no fire and i see that i'm right 
You're talking hard, partner, but you ain't got it in you to do what you think you can do. Jack dropped onto a nearby stool. The revolver clattered upon the floor. He buried his face in his hands. As the thoughts whirled maddeningly through his brain, he realized that Hank Sherry was right, and still that steady voice went on. Ten minutes is all you needed, and if you come right down to it, ten minutes is all most folks need. The things we do that send us to hell, and the things we do that send us the other way, why, there's only ten minutes thinking between them. 6. He waited, not even to shave the black beard from his face, but in five minutes his pack was made and he was on the back of Brown Susan. From the darkness beside him he heard the mountaineer calling, So long, I'll be seeing you later, son. Jack returned no answer. The very sound of Sherry's voice roused him to a wild desire for murder. But in another moment Susan was at full gallop across the clearing, and the fresh wind was beating against his face and blowing out of his memory all the horrors of the cabin. That shuddering sense that he was marked to the end of time kept him cold of heart as the good mare climbed the first long grade toward the west, but after a time that thought began to grow smaller and smaller in his mind, and finally it was forgotten. For he was young, and the night was new, and over his shoulder he could look at the pale thin sickle of a new moon rising, and no matter through what horrors he had passed, the point of importance was that they now lay behind him. He climbed the top of that long slope. Below him he saw a valley opening out, long and narrow among the peaks, and brown Susan went down the descent like a racing deer. Before she reached the leveler going below, Jack Bristol was on the verge of singing, and all that had happened fifteen miles behind him among the mountains might as well have been fifteen years ago. It was a pleasant valley into which he had dropped out of the highlands. It was thick with houses, a narrow river went talking through the midst of it, and it watered a fertile land on either side. For the fields were small, telling of close tillage, the barns were numerous, which told that the yield was rich. He could not make out much in details, for now a mist of high-blown clouds began to veil even the faint light of the new moon, but he could at least make out the forms of horses and cattle in the pastures, and even in the dark of night he could sense the happy prosperity of that region. Brown Susan, in the meantime, was frolicking along a road far smoother and better kept than those to which she was accustomed, and she made the best of the fast going. She had a colt's love of sprinting, and now she kept up on the bit, fairly dancing with an eagerness to get away. Once or twice Jack indulged her, but on the whole he kept her back to a steady jog. He had only one great purpose in mind, and that was to put as much distance as possible between himself and the cabin among the mountains. At one long ride he wanted to get out of the district of all who might know Hank Sherry and his branded forehead. A schoolhouse, a flare with lights for some entertainment or dance, sadly shook his purpose, however. It was many a long week since he had danced, and now the sound of a shrill violin blowing faintly to him made Jack Bristol turn Susan to the side and bring her up into the shadow of a dense little grove of trees. From this point of vantage he could hear every strain of the music, and even the slipping of dancing feet upon the floor was plainly audible. Between dances, too, he saw the couples pour out of the little school and waltz hither and yon over the schoolyard, and then their voices, and even fragments of their talk, floated plainly to him. It was all wonderfully enticing to Jack. The deep voices of the men were like a challenge. The sweet voices of the girls were like a call to him. In another time he would have ridden to the hitching racks and tethered his horse and gone in to find a partner but now he carried on his forehead the brand which held him more effectually than even rope or chain could have done. For the first time there dawned in his brain an understanding of what Sherry might have meant when he said that he would soon see Jack again. For might not the world shun him and drive him back to the one shelter which remained open to him? That thought had scarcely come home to him with a stunning blow, 
when he heard two voices speaking so close to him that they seemed to blow up out of the ground so i said let her stop then cut me off i'll get on by myself lee why are you always so antagonistic when you talk with your father because he's always so antagonistic when he talks with me but he has a right to talk severely to his own son not about you nell he can damn me all he pleases about other things but when he begins to talk about you the man paused in a silence of outraged and virtuous indignation for a moment the girl did not answer just what does he say asked nell at length in the first place he strings out a long lingo about what i owe to my family don't laugh at that lee it is an old family and it has an honourable record there'll be nothing in the whole record as fine as my marriage with nell kearney you silly boy breathed nell and her pleasure put a quiver in her voice you'll never listen to reason after we're married then i'll listen to tons of reason but has he anything else against me dad's poverty i suppose no that doesn't seem to bother the governor but he has an idea that i should be making a good fat income before i marry that's nonsense mining engineers don't begin on a salary equal to a millionaire's income i tell him that but he refuses to see the light but once we marry now we'll do you really think that might change him think i know it couldn't help but change him oh listen the music struck into a swinging waltz well what's up queried the man don't you hear let's hurry in that waltz i danced to that last winter till i was sick of it now let's stay here there's something more important than dancing i guess she was silent then jack could hear her humming the air lightly her escort in the meantime lighted a match and applied it to a tailor-made cigarette the flare showed jack bristol first of all a big well-made handsome youth in his middle twenties nattily dressed with his hair sleek back on his head then as the cigarette caught the flame and he opened his cupped hands the smoker allowed the light to reach to the girl opposite him it was only for a flash before the match streaked downward to the ground and was tramped out but in the first flash bristol saw enough from that instant what they said on the far side of the tree was not simply casual chatter every word she uttered was of vital importance that tugged jack forward in his saddle and held him breathless to the end as though she were disposing of his destiny as well as her own now to get down to business said the man of the tailor-made cigarette i'll tell you what i really think that when you marry me the old man will rave like the devil for a few days and after that he'll forgive us and take us home take us home echoed the girl a little sharply but i don't want to be taken home i don't want to sit about in that old house of your father's and have your family circle about in the offing freezing me with glances and half smiles they'll never do that dear ten minutes of you in that house will thaw out the whole crew they'll forget themselves and fall in love with you in a flock i know them nell but after all don't you want to start a home of your own lee well, that used to be the idea said the man but times have changed this is the twentieth century and homes don't start without plenty of coin mixed in with the foundation concrete don't be out of date my dear you say that in a rather patronizing way protested the girl with a touch of acid in her tone that pleased jack immensely i don't mean it in that way answered the other at once but the point now is that we have use for the old man even if he has no use for us he laughed at his joke jack noticed that he laughed alone a man can't get along on a beggarly beginner's salary went on lee not when he's been raised as i've been raised won't do a man can't bring up his son to million-dollar tastes and then dodge him all at once and tell him to start for himself and the old man wouldn't dream o doing that not if i'd marry where he wants me to marry don't you see how the whole nasty mess turns out first he gives me the tastes of an english lord and when those tastes are fixed in my blood he has me in his power he can dictate my course of action if i displease him no matter where or when he can simply hold over my head the threat of cutting off my allowance 
lee you don't mean to say that you still get an allowance from him why not dear why not anything disgraceful in that good gad they pay mining engineers nothing to speak of but experience for the first few years and a man can't keep up his bridge to say nothing of his poker when his salary is chiefly experience he laughed again at this jest and again he laughed alone once more jack was greatly pleased the thing for us to do declared lee at length is to step out and get married and tell the old man about it later that's what i fix up for to-night lee i didn't tell you i didn't have time to ask you first i knew you'd agree but i don't agree you will when i explain you see it was devilish hard for me to break away this evening it has taken three days of lies for me to lay all the plans and even now if i go back i'll have to face a battery of questions so i decided that we'd make the fullest possible use of our time and that will be to ride down the road and let the minister lee what on earth are you talking about there was a breath of silence then now have i taken too much for granted haven't you really meant what you said to me or was it as i've often suspected simply that when they carried me into your house all smashed up by the fall from that fool of a horse you set your teeth and decided that you'd save my life simply because it was so nearly gone and when my life was saved you thought that you were in love with me simply because you'd been with me so long is that it jack bristol liked the stranger better than before he had spoken slowly seriously humbly no said the girl it isn't that i really do care for you lee but a marriage like that what's wrong with it you're as hot-headed as they come i know you don't object to the rush of it nell no not a bit not if it was serious and honest but it isn't it's all a bluff with which you're trying to force your father's hand isn't that so a bluff no it's a great big game nell that's a polite name for it will you do one thing of course then get your horse and ride down the road i'll meet you there in ten minutes beyond the cemetery we can have it out on the road if you don't agree well it will have to stand that way if you do agree then we'll be on the way to the minister's house is that fair nell i suppose so but you've given your word cried lee eagerly very well then said the girl without enthusiasm i'll be there End of chapter 6 Chapters 7 and 8 of The Cross Brand by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 7. Jack watched them go. He waited until they were well out of sight toward the schoolhouse and the tangle of horses in front of the building. Then he drew back Brown Susan and surveyed the road. He had no right to come any further into the business than his involuntary eavesdropping had in the first place brought him, but he had no full control over what he did that evening. The long imprisonment in the sherry cabin among the upper mountains had served to store up an immense energy in him. Now it was striving for an outlet, and the first opportunity which he saw was to work with might and main to prevent the meeting of the young mining engineer and the girl. What he should do after that did not enter his head. The first and important task was to see that the two did not meet again. Now he saw the girl go scurrying down the road on a fast-stepping galloper she disappeared around a distant bend and after a considerable interval another figure on horseback followed a big man on a big horse unquestionably it must be the man named lee jack let him go back then he loosed brown susan in pursuit she had travelled hard and far already this night but the brief rest under the trees had been sufficient to breathe her once more she was full of running and she showed her delight on being turned loose by sprinting down the road at a dizzying pace that brought her in striking distance of the other within the first half mile indeed so swift was her approach that though the velvet dust on the road muffled her hoof-beats the big man turned in his saddle to watch his pursuer hello called jack bristol 
and as he waved his hand in the dark the other drew rein and waved in return jack swept up on him like a thunderbolt it was hardly fair but he had been lately deeply schooled in unfair tactics what's up called the other a fight damn you said jack and as the mare shot alongside he leaned wound his arm round the waist of lee and dragged him out of the saddle while susan went by as for the gray which lee had been riding no sooner did it feel the weight lifting from reins and saddle than it flirted heels high in the air and then bolted down a by-path and across country hell and fire shouted the dismounted man is this a joke or a hold-up you infernal hound i'll break you in two he had twisted around as he spoke in vain jack strove to free himself from his burden in another instant they both toppled heavily to the ground while brown susan danced a few paces away and stood watching them deeply bewildered with one ear pricked and one ear back surely it was strange to see men act as these were acting taken by surprise in the first onset the mining engineer needed only an instant to rouse himself and then he proved a man's task to handle for he had some twenty-odd pounds of advantage in weight and all that advantage was in trained muscle besides he was a skilled boxer and wrestler jack could tell that in an instant for as they fell he found himself caught in a bone-crushing grip that threatened to smash in his ribs he freed himself from that hold by clipping his fist across the back of lee's head with an oath the latter disentangled himself and sprang to his feet up himself with the speed of a cat jack was in time to duck under a straight shooting left and then he began to fight he began to fight with a silent song somewhere behind his lips he began to fight as he had not fought since he was a child for in latter years in moments of crises it had been gunplay always and never fists but a good lesson once learned can never be entirely forgotten the old rhythm of dancing feet and darting hands returned to him almost at once and he put into the fury of his attack all of the unbent wrath which had been heaping up in him since hank sherry caught and made him a prisoner big lee trained athlete and courageous man that he was fought back heartily but jack split upon him as rain splits upon a roof rim it was in vain that lee stopped one rush with a thudding blow which landed squarely on jack's chest it was in vain that he knocked the smaller man flying with a second pile-driver which snapped flush upon the point of his chin for jack rebounded from the earth and dove in again for more his left hand was a shadow with a weight of a sledge-hammer flying in it his right hand was a thrust of flameless fire before the one big lee staggered and when the right crashed home he went down on his face wrapped in a heavy sleep jack bristol singing through his teeth dropped to his knees and pressed an ear to the back of the fallen man the beat of the heart was slow but steady and jack sprang up again leaped into the saddle upon susan and sent her off down the road again at a rattling pace in his heart too there was a sense of great and satisfactory accomplishment the waters of wrath which had been piling up in him for the many days had now burst the dam and were expended in his heart there was only a great good will toward all the world he put a mile and a half behind him then to the left he saw the pale glimmer of the white headstones in the graveyard seen indistinctly through the night and among the trunks of the trees which overgrew the cemetery he rounded the curve beyond it and there was the girl her horse only faintly perceptible where it stood beneath a thin screen of young poplars but jack reined susan to a stop near by lady he called i'm bringing you a message she rode out to meet him a message she echoed him from whom and who are you from lee and she urged he can't come ah there was an accident of what nature asked the girl he met a man and well and there was trouble about what 
good heavens what are you trying to say has lee been hurt i heard no gun cried the girl and the dread and pain in her voice went through and through jack one of those brutal bullies some gunfighter who hated him for his good english and his clothes oh tell me everything oh no i can find out what has happened when take your hand off my reins for as she started to spur past him jack caught at the reins and stopped her there's no such hurry said he he ain't hurt bad there was no gun play but you said there was trouble there was it was all with the hands though that trouble they mobbed him then cried the girl in angry scorn oh the cowards maybe you'd call it a mob said jack and he grinned in spite of himself but there was only one man that stopped him one man breathed the girl one man stopped lee jarvis i don't believe it he'll be coming along in ten or fifteen minutes said jack then you can ask him he's got to catch his hoss first and after that he'll be coming along but he sent you i don't understand my head is whirling will you tell me just what happened it all started said jack when he scratched a match is this a joke not for me lady i'm plumb serious then try to explain if you please you're willing to wait here till lee comes along of course that is if he hasn't been seriously hurt it goes back to that match i was talking about said jack when he lighted that match and his cigarette he thought that as the end ah cried the girl i think i understand you were under those trees you were eavesdropping i was just listening in said jack because i thought it would save you and him from a pile of embarrassment at first if i didn't tell you that i was there and that somebody else had heard the secret it didn't make no difference what i heard because i was on my way west and out of this part of the country and i'd never see you or hear of you again you see that i don't fully understand anything you say but then he scratched that match said jack and do you know what an old man i once knew used to say that a pretty girl belonged to the whole wide world every man jack of us had a right to admire him but that's what the match showed me what in the world is in your mind cried the girl and now her voice was a trifle high and strained well said jack when i saw your face i knew that it wouldn't work you knew what i knew that jarvis would never put his deal through because you would never help him and you'd never help him because it wasn't square he paused the girl did not reply but at the same time there was no use letting him try to sweep you off your feet went on jack so after you'd gone by i waited until i saw him start up the road and then i dropped in behind and stopped him we had a little argument and he stayed behind and here i am will you let me pass asked the girl in a very small voice will you let me go back i see nodded jack you're afraid but after all i guess you won't go so saying he dropped the reins and drew susan back she stepped away nimbly and allowed plenty of room to the girl to ride down the road in fact she spoke to her horse but she drew the animal up before it could make a step one prophecy at least had come true eight once more they faced each other in a breathing space of silence and how eloquent felt jack bristol silence could be why did you say that asked the girl at length that you wouldn't ride away yet yes what made you presume to read my mind like that because said jack i'd seen your face by the light of that match you talk queer nonsense said the girl and i knew continued jack that you wouldn't run where there was no danger i wonder said the girl if you are not more dangerous than you seem but will you continue and tell me everything why i stopped him it makes my blood boil to think that any man could stop him cried the girl it was a lucky right said jack meditatively a what it landed right on the point of the chin said jack he went to sleep as though someone were rocking a cradle ah said the girl no matter by what trickery you struck him down she paused to go right back to the beginning said jack i saw that it wouldn't be right for you to meet him because it wouldn't be square not honest not exactly what jarvis wants to do is to hold up the old man by marrying you 
he figures that his father ain't going to let his son live too poor so he'll take a chance on marrying you and waiting for old jarvis to raise the coin isn't that the straight of it it's but why should i talk about such things with you because it's night said jack and it don't do no harm to let a gent that you'll never see again help you think and i'm never to see you again asked the girl taking up that part of his statement never said jack i'm gone before morning if there's any luck with me who are you i can't tell you that if i could be so free with my name i wouldn't be in such a hurry you've done something wrong said the girl eagerly and you're running away from the consequences i've done something right corrected jack by keeping a girl from doing something wrong you've chosen to act as my conscience then i've done what ten minutes of thinking would have made you do said jack he quoted old sherry with gusto i stepped in between you and a jump in the dark that's all what makes you so sure because if you'd have waited for him here you'd have gone on with him never that is not unless i had made up my mind that he was right that's what you think you'd have done but i figure that you couldn't help yourself once folks get started why it's like trying to dam a river that's running down a steep hill they climb right over the dam nope you couldn't help yourself lady besides it's at night and when folks can't see what's around them all chances look good it's what the night does suppose you'd met me like this by daylight do you think i'd have had a chance to talk one minute to you nope you'd a rode on down the trail and showed me nothing but a cloud of dust you're a very queer fellow said the girl and i think you're right about part of what you say how do you explain it why am i staying here and listening because it's the faces of people that we're afraid of not their talk it isn't what they say it's the ugly faces of em while they're saying it am i right i suppose you are said the girl slowly and listen broke in jack down the road came the rapid and muffled beat of the hoofs of a horse it's lee jarvis coming on the jump to get you said jack oh cried the girl we can hide by riding down that alley said jack hide why should i hide do i have to fight him again fight lady said jack it's been a long time since i've had a real honest engine all leather fight if you say the word him and me tangle but if you figure there's a premium on his face just ride down that little trail with me and wait under the trees till he's tired of looking for you around here this outrage cried the girl there's no time for talk said jack you can lay to this lady i ain't started all the trouble that i've taken tonight to give up at the last minute without a fight you can tell me what you think of me and my kind later on there was a muffled exclamation from the girl then without a word she swung the head of her horse to one side and galloped him down the lane it was but a twisting little bridle path among the trees and instantly they were lost to view from the main road a hundred yards from their starting place jack dropped from the saddle and standing in front of the girl's horse held his hand ready to choke off a neigh if jarvis's horse should be heard in the distance at the same time he spoke to susan and the mare came up and nosed his shoulder inquisitively in the meantime the beat of the hoofs of the jarvis horse sounded small and dull on the road the sound stopped there was silence for a minute or two then the hoof-beats were heard retreating and there you are said jack swinging back into the saddle once more the thing's done and no bones broken her answer astonished him you and your horse are wonderful chums she said it's easy to see that susan and i said jack gaping at the girl through the darkness of course we are but lady suppose i see you home she began to laugh and the sound of that laughter paralyzed jack at a stroke the initiative which he had maintained from the first was lost to him i can find my way home alone said this strange girl who seemed to rise all the stronger out of defeat but if you wish to come along why i'll be very glad to have you he fell in at her side they cut straight across country jumping the fences as they came to each barrier 
they went at first in another of the silences which from time to time fell between them but after a time she said of course you were wrong about one thing and that was that i could be swept off my feet by lee jarvis oh, maybe i was wrong said jack humbly right now i'd figure that you could handle about anything that's a way men have said the girl after they've done something for a woman she stopped herself short and switched to a new topic a little while ago you said that you were never coming into this part of the country again i really wish that you'd tell me why when i started through said jack slowly it was because i wanted to get out to a new country but now there's another main reason well it's one i can't tell you that's not fair said the girl you know i'll never rest until i hear what it is i couldn't tell you said jack frankly except that i'm never to see you again but you're the reason lady if you were a little bit different i'd come back through hellfire to find you again but if i talk to you long enough you'd do nothing but laugh at my grammar she shook her head i think it would take a most unusual person to laugh at you on any account she said and certainly bad grammar is nothing but she came to another abrupt pause reining in her horse there's my house do you see that's dad's house yonder on top of that little hill i'll stop here then you don't take me to my door well if you want me to said jack sadly and not another word passed between them until he had reached the horse shed and drawn the saddle from her horse i wonder if lee jarvis has come here already to inquire about me murmured the girl i figure he won't answer jack he doesn't bother your father much eh he was walking by her side toward the house with brown susan following at his heels now the girl stopped short why did you say that how did you know that and who can you be lady said jack i'm a friend that wishes you luck let it go at that she walked on before he knew it they stood at the door of the house Goodbye, said Jack, and held out his hand. Goodbye, and good luck, and no Lee Jarvis in your luck. Instead of taking the extended hand, she struck back sharply at the door, which flew wide and allowed a bright shaft of light to fall upon Jack. He saw the half mischievous smile of expectation which had formed upon her lips die her eyes fixed on his face grew large with terror and with a shriek she turned and fled into the house fled in mortal agony of terror with her head half turned to watch the horror pursue and jack knew that she had seen the cross on his forehead End of chapter eight